What happens to F1 drivers when they have massive crashes? For example, Roman Grosjean went through 67G in his horrendous shunt in Bahrain, and some drivers have got even higher in the past. But how do drivers survive, and what goes on inside their bodies and heads? Well, I wanted to find out how much danger drivers are really in, because it's something that I've experienced myself. Back in 2006, I had the biggest racing crash of my life. I was racing Indy Lights at Watkins Glen, an old school American circuit. It's very fast with barely any runoff areas. My car had been fighting brake issues all weekend, and minutes before my single lap qualifying run, we found a leak in the brake cylinder. But the team managed a quick fix, and I put in a good qualifying lap, ending up third. But then I made a decision that changed everything. Instead of taking it easy on the in-lap, I kept on pushing. Because I hadn't had much running in testing, I wanted more data for the race. About a third of the way through the lap, as I tried to slow down for the very fast outer loop corner, the brake pedal went straight to the floor. There was nothing. The car went off the track and slammed into the barrier. The impact ripped the entire gearbox clean off the car. What followed was fuzzy. I remember sitting days next to the crashed car, then trying to actually get back into it. Between my fractured foot, hand and the hit to my head, I clearly wasn't thinking straight. But here's the crazy part. I told the medical team that I was fine. I had no idea I was concussed. I just didn't know what to look out for. And I'm not alone. Even in Formula 1, with the most advanced safety technology in the world, these injuries can be invisible on medical scans. When drivers experience massive crashes, their bodies endure forces that are almost impossible to imagine. For a split second, they can experience well over 50 G, 50 times their normal body weight. Verstappen hit 51 G at Silverstone, Grosjean hit 67 G in Bahrain, and Kubica hit a staggering 75 G in Canada. So what actually happens during a big crash? Let's take a look at some footage of a Formula 2 car crash testing from the FIA. First, the nose cone crumples, folding like an accordion. This is the front crash structure compressing, absorbing massive forces and doing exactly what it's designed to do. But inside the car, the driver's body moves against the six-point harnesses. Their helmet moves forward and is restrained by the hands device, their head moves inside the helmet, and a fraction of a second later, their brain moves within the fluid inside their skull. All of this happens in milliseconds. It's a sequence of destruction, but each step is carefully engineered to do its best to protect the human inside. Thank you to the FIA for supporting us with the creation of this video and giving us incredible behind the scenes access to their research, experts and latest safety innovations. This is Nuno Costa, the FIA's safety director who explained how these structures work. So basically, you know, uh, the impact structures they are designed to absorb, so absorb energy. So we need when there is an impact, we need to have structures that can absorb energy. The goal is simple. Take a car traveling at massive speeds and slow it down as gently as possible. The longer the car takes to stop, the more those forces can be spread out, changed from a huge spike of energy into something that's survivable. Modern cars, they, um, uh, they have very advanced um, uh, structures uh, to, to absorb energy. So we have a monocoque uh, that is very rigid and is designed to protect the driver. Uh, but then outside of the monocoque, we have uh, different impact structures. We have front impact structures, side and rear impact structures. And it's not just the car. The FAA scrutinizes every component involved in a crash. The barriers at the tracks are designed to flex and move, working with the car's crash structures. The driver's helmet, hands device and safety harnesses all play their part in carefully absorbing energy. And here we're talking about F1, but what about motorsports where traditional safety features aren't available? Take rallying, for example. The course might stretch for miles through mountains, forests, or deserts. Terrain that's impossible to protect with safety barriers. There are no gravel traps or runoff areas, often just trees. And trees don't like to move out of your way. So when you lose the energy absorption of a barrier, 
what do you do? We have to be very innovative. Um, we, need, we have to think out of the box and we have a very fantastic, a clever system. Away to the couple, driver and uh, seat, and, and put driver and seat from the car, because uh, the car has a massive energy. Uh, so with that decoupling, then we, we managed to put some foam, so we call it rally uh, door foam, that uh, with uh, the space available between the door and the seat, we can absorb a massive amount of energy. But what happens to your brain when you crash a race car? After all the safety systems do their job, there's one final impact that we can't see. What happens inside your skull? I spoke to Dr. Sean Petherbridge, president of the FAA Medical Commission, to explain more. Your brain is a soft organ. People know, of course, that the skull is hard. Your brain then will continue to move a little bit. And in the case of a crash that's a frontal impact, it will bounce forwards and backwards a little bit in the skull. The dynamic of the crash can have an influence. If there's a rotational force, then so too will your brain rotate, which is obviously not very good for your brain. Think of your brain like jelly inside a hard container. A sudden stop doesn't just move it, it sends ripples and waves through the whole thing. In a race car crash, those forces can be massive. And rotational force, the kind that makes your brain twist, is particularly dangerous. Because your brain can handle some movement, but it struggles with the sudden violent motion that comes from an impact at racing speeds. The brain tissue is getting microscopic tears or subtle damage at the cellular level, which has a consequence, releases chemicals. And brain cells, neurons, they need two main things. One is oxygen and one is glucose, and you, you can find that when you study the cells themselves that they are, because of the disruption, they are getting deficient in, if you like, the nutrients that they need. And one of the worrying things is that it's difficult to understand how bad a crash is just by looking at it. A dramatic crash with parts flying everywhere might leave a driver perfectly fine, while a smaller hit could cause a serious injury, depending on exactly how the forces travel through their body and brain. And when your brain gets damaged like this, like I had in my crash, it's called a concussion. An injury invisible to the naked eye, and even hard to spot on medical scans. Yet it can dramatically affect how a driver thinks and acts. So how do you detect something that you can't even see? Well, that is a challenge. In Formula 1, every crash is captured from multiple angles. A high-speed camera records at 400 frames per second, showing exactly how a driver's head moves during an impact. But that's just the beginning. Inside the car, there's the black box. Accident data recorders that track every detail of a crash. And in the driver's earplugs, there are tiny accelerometers measuring the forces on their heads during an impact. But this level of crash detection isn't available in most motorsport. Once you go down on the ladder, uh, then the quality and quantity of the data is very, very limited. And it's in the grassroots where we have more accidents. And that's why the FAA created something revolutionary. A small device weighing just 12 grams that could transform safety across all levels of racing. It's called an impact data recorder, designed to be fitted and forgotten, measuring crash forces without needing maintenance for two years. But what about the thing that's actually protecting the driver's head? Well, over the years, helmets have evolved dramatically. We've come a long way from the basic leather helmets of the 50s. Today, drivers use carbon fiber and Kevlar shells with advanced energy absorbing foams. And if you've seen my video from Stilo, you'll know that one of the biggest improvements came after Felipe Massa's accident when he was struck by a spring in Hungary. Now, all helmets include advanced ballistic protection, specifically designed to prevent similar injuries. But maybe the most powerful tool in improving safety isn't physical at all. It's virtual. Using advanced computer simulations, the FAA engineers can now test countless crash scenarios without putting anyone at risk. Uh, with simulations, and uh, we use some models very, very advanced, you can go to that level of detail. But more important than that, you can do much more simulations. So it's more cost effective. So you present different crash scenarios. You can understand what happened in more in detail. You can do different variants, try to look to different uh, factors. These simulations are incredibly detailed. 
modeling everything from the size and weight of the driver to the exact forces involved in different types of crashes. And it's this combination of physical and virtual testing that makes motorsports safer at every level. So how do you even know if you have a concussion? And this is important even if you're not a racing driver. What do you do if you hit your head? Looking back at my crash, the scariest part wasn't the impact, although that was pretty scary, but it was the fact that I had no idea what a concussion even felt like. No one had ever explained to me what to look out for, but there are specific signs. When somebody has a concussion, in the very immediate aftermath, they may have a slight personality change, appear quite aggressive, they may have some amnesia, be a little forgetful, not remember the incident. And that gives way quite quickly to nausea, headache, a general feeling of fatigue. The tricky part is spotting these symptoms in the heat of the moment. After a crash, your adrenaline is pumping, you might be angry about what happened, and it's hard to tell what's normal race day emotion and what's not. However, if you're concussed, you might feel confused, forget names, or have trouble finding words. And more serious signs, like slurred speech, need immediate medical attention. But the most important thing to do if you suspect a concussion is to be honest and speak up. Tell your team, find a doctor, and get checked out. The hardest part is being willing to step away from racing. However, if you have hit your head, your brain will need time to heal. And there'll always be another race day, but only if the drivers take care of themselves. Thank you very much for watching, and I want to say a huge thank you to the FAA for giving us the incredible access to their research, experts, and safety innovations. If you want to understand how F1 helmets protect drivers, I actually went to the factory where they're made. Check out that video just here. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.